So welcome everyone to the book launch of Spinning the Secrets of State. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today, the Kulin Nations people, and pay respect to the elders past and present. So my name is Maddie and I'm the coordinator of the New International Bookshop. Um, so NIBS is Melbourne's independent, not-for-profit, radical left bookshop. We are currently running from my bedroom and all um, our orders are now online at nibs.org.au. So this talk is co-hosted and has been helped out a lot by Monash University Publishing. So thank you to Sam for helping and putting us all together tonight. So just a little heads up that um, the chat will be directed to the host only during this talk. We are recording for YouTube and are on Facebook Live right now. If you have any questions, please type question into the chat and I'll call upon you after the speakers have finished speaking. So both of our speakers tonight specialise in Australian intelligence. Justin McPhee has written articles concerned with Australian intelligence in, and media manipulation, the East Timor years, whistleblower witness K, and the politics of intelligence during the conscription in the early 20th century. With these articles and now this book, he has shown a history in Australian intelligence pushing political policies and agendas. Clinton Fernandez's work is focused around Australia's national security, in particular, intelligence matters and Australia's relation with the Southeast Asian neighbours. He has been entwined in intelligence leaks, operations and discussions since his 20s when serving the military. For over a decade, he has been a part of efforts to release National Archives of Australia that demonstrate Australia's knowledge of violence perpetrated against the Timorese in the early 1980s. Fernandez has a unique in integration of personal experience, research and activism. Today we are launching McPhee's book, Spinning the Secrets of State. Here he documents and analyzes Australian intelligence converging with political agenda. He continues his previous research and shows how ASIO politicizes their intelligence. It is so important that we know what our government is doing and how our government seeps their agenda into the mainstream. Please join me in welcoming Justin and Clinton. Thank you, Maddie. Do we uh, have questions or can I kick off? You're, about, you're muted. Am I, can you hear me okay, Clinton? How about you kick off? Uh, tell me what the book is about, please. Ah, well, it's a pretty broad question, really. Um, I, I think in a, in a broad sense, it's about politics. It's about political prejudgments. It's about corruption, espionage, and spying. Um, but I think mainly uh, what it's about is when all of these things commingle and um, become politicized. So really one of the main things that the book uh, investigates is the relationship between intelligence and policy and the potential for this relationship to become corrupted um, and politicized. What I've tried to do in the book is um, try to think about how this happens and give some explanations as to why it happens so frequently. Um, I think if we sort of think about this idea of intelligence politicization, um, intelligence has been at some of the largest controversies over the last sort of few decades. Um, I mean, we only have to recall that now notorious case in Iraq in 2003. Um, but we can also recall things like what are happening in the United States at the moment. Um, but I think what, effects, what a lot of folks don't realize um, is, and one of the main propositions of my book is that these types of events um, have happened quite frequently. And if you look back through our own political history, um, you will find that there are many, many examples of intelligence being uh, used and misused for political advantage. Can I just uh, ask you though, before we get into any of these examples, what is intelligence politicization? Ah, well, it is a, it's a bit of a slippery uh, question, Clinton. Um, and I think one of the main things you notice if you pay attention to these sorts of things is that um, there's an extraordinary lack of clarity about what politicization actually is. Um, and in many ways, it can be just used to refer to any sort of political incident that has been framed um, in a way that we 
perhaps see unsatisfactory or uh, are not happy with the outcome. Um, and I'm very aware of these, this slippery notion of what politicization is. And I was um, trying to put uh, fairly strict fences around um, what I am talking about. So in terms of intelligence politicization, the way I see it is, it's the manipulation of intelligence to reflect a preferred political outcome. Um, so that's the main gist of it. Okay, that, that's fair enough. And uh, yes, you want to talk, there is the Iraq case, but we can mm. see this is a matter of great urgency now uh, as we stand on the threshold of a new Cold War with China <laughs> with all kinds of intelligence claims um, and it's very hard to evaluate. Uh, yeah. So could you uh, talk about um, the use of intelligence to push a particular cause or to discredit a cause or a person? Can you, can you explain that? Sure. Um, I think... The thing about intelligence is that it carries a certain mantle of objectivity, um, a certain mantle of um, impartiality, um, that for political leaders, this is very useful um, when brought into political, to, into political discussion, and it can be used to sell um, controversial decisions because it's very persuasive. Um, but the other aspect of it is we never actually get to see um, what has informed those intelligence decisions. So, I mean, the other thing is that it, it's very persuasive in terms of discrediting opposition to policy goals. Um, and I think, you know, you can look back at some of the cases in Australian history. I think one that pops to mind would be Menzies and, um, you know, his uh, infamous use of using intelligence to discredit some of the early um, communist uh, or alleged communists in the trade union movement during the 1950s. And uh, what he did there is he got intelligence and he used it for his own advantage to discredit those people um, that he saw were um, adversarial to his own policy. Uh, were, they, were those people in fact um, communists as uh, he alleged them to be, but more importantly, were there in fact a threat to Australia's national security? Well, I, I think the idea of them being a threat to Australia's national security is, is, is greatly exaggerated. Um, it is likely, it, it's, it's, look, many of them were com members of the Communist Party, undoubtedly. Um, but yeah, the threat to national security is a whole other issue. Um, and we also know that after Menzies made these statements to Parliament, um, that he had to redact a, a lot of those claims because many of the, uh, the men that he named actually uh, were not involved at all. But if they, were, if they were simply the political opposition by having a perspective that the world ought to be run around collective lines or um, through a communist organization, mm. that's the political, that's their political view. Mm. Where does that slip into a threat to national security and how, can, how is intelligence used to, to push that barrel? Well, it, it's, really, it's really hard to see. I mean, when I was looking at that case, I, I, I don't really understand how it was seen as a, any threat to national security. I mean, these people were members of the uh, trade unions, um, but this, this seemed to be part of the, um, the discourse of the day, you know, that the communism regardless was a threat to national security. But what I actually think was happening there is communism was, communism was seen as a threat to the government's policy position. And intelligence at this time was used to discredit those people. So it's not just if they were, if you have people who um, are believed or alleged to be loyal to a foreign country, in this case, um, the leadership of the Communist Party of the mm. Soviet Union, um, and if they were in a sensitive public service positions, mm. um, you make a separation between that and simply membership of a trade union or, or <laughs> is that right? Well, I mean, there was very little separation actually made there. Um, it was just seen that the trade union movement um, was largely... Uh, how should we say, disruptive to um, the government or the, the Liberal government's political agenda at the time. So, um, you know, it, it was really about discrediting those people in the public's eye. And one way that that could be achieved is to dig up dirt on them through using ASIO. Okay, you've given a very good example in the book uh, involving the uh, former prime or the former Prime Minister, now deceased, uh, Malcolm Fraser, mm. and the use of intelligence to target 
and discredit people in the peace movement in Vietnam yeah. Um, yeah. Be because th these things are are forgotten. This was like 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. Could you please lay out what happened with uh, a, a schoolboy and his mother who were targeted? Ah, ah well, yes. Um, this is a fairly um, infamous case now uh, of the Michaelis family, actually. Robert Michaelis, Michaelis who was the 15-year-old schoolboy at a Sydney grammar school in 1966. At the Sydney grammar school? Yeah, and he was... Well, at the time, the, there were programs in schools for cadet training, and that involved students um, going out in the playground and enacting scenarios where they would fight uh, the Vietnamese um, so-called enemy. And he refused to participate in these claims, and he was expelled from the grammar school. What was the scenario that he was uh, required to participate in, in this, in this, in this uh, uh, counterinsurgency thing at school? Yeah, well, he called them um, guerrilla operations, and they were allegedly um, teams. So schoolboys would be pitted against other schoolboys to go out and enact sort of, um, you know, uh, sorties of the sort and um, work out ways of, you know, dominating the enemy and things like so that. So targeting uh, South Vietnamese villages? Yes. And he refused to do that? He refused to do that, and he was expelled for refusing to do it. Now, this was then brought up in Parliament um, only a few days after this, and uh, the Labour opposition was saying, well, you know, this is basically indoctrinating school kids into your uh, Vietnam war fighting machine. And Malcolm Fraser didn't see it that way, and he, um, he actually saw it more as uh, part of the resistance to the policy of sending people uh, to Vietnam. And he got information from ASIO um, about the boy's mother, about uh, Robert Michaelis's mother. And he said that she was a member of um, the International Cooperation for, uh, what is it? Disarmament. The Committee for International Cooperation, yeah. right. Yeah. And she was also a member of all of these other activist groups. Um, and in the process, um, uh, Malcolm Fraser put into the hands of um, many details, including the home address of Mrs. Michaelis and the boy. And um, yeah, they, they basically set about a campaign to discredit them because they saw this as part of the movement to discredit the uh, Vietnamese um, fighting, uh, the Australian contribution to Vietnam at the time. What was ASIO's role in, that, uh, in the use of this intelligence uh, by the, uh, the then minister, Malcolm Fraser? Well, uh, Malcolm Fraser, as we know, was then Minister for the Army, so he would have been privy to some information, but also Harold Holt at the time was um, privy to this information. And the following day, he also uh, brought up uh, in Parliament information about the Michaelis family. Um, and the interesting thing is that if you look at the archival records, you can see that Holt was very unfamiliar about this because he copped a lot of flack in the press about using ASIO material in Parliament um, to actually you know, discredit people in the way that he had, de had done. And he talked to, to the Director General of ASIO at the time, Charles Spry, and you can see Charles Spry advising him that, um, well, a couple of things. Charles Spry was advising him that this uh, was a fairly normalized practice, but he also advised Holt to probably refrain from using ASIO material in Parliament. Um, the interesting thing, but, is if you keep looking and following through with those records, you can see that that did not happen. Right. Um, there, are, there are some interesting parallels um, in the contemporary period too, no? With uh, yeah. uh, the, uh, the search for fifth columnists um, in Australia, oh, yes. uh, yeah. but so on, and we can get into that later on. Sure. All right. Sure. Um, so, um, but isn't intelligence always political? Well, absolutely, it is, and and we shouldn't forget that intelligence is essentially a political activity. It looks into the politics of you know foreign states, um, but I think you know there are distinctions that really need to be made here. There's a difference between an intelligence agency advising a government. Um, about potential threats to national security. And we have to remember that it is an adversarial, a, an advisory role, sorry. Um, but once intelligence crosses this sort of, uh, this, this dividing line and starts advocating for policy 
and um, providing information to politicians to discredit opposition, this is when it becomes politicized. Right. Uh, and uh, can you talk about any of the other uh, significant cases that you might have yeah. found? But, but before you do that, um, is there a, like, who would you say would be the main culprits um, mm. responsible for politicization in the course of the research that you've examined? Yeah, look, this is a really interesting thing. Um, when, I, when I first began, at the very early days when I began this research, I kind of, I was coming at it from the perspective of, you know, just after what had happened in um, the intelligence um, pre-Iraq war in 2003. And I thought, m my starting assumption was really that, you know, I think this is intelligence agencies that are really um, responsible for politicizing um, the work that they do. And it was actually a very surprising finding um, after I'd completed um, the research that I reassessed this. And I actually found that based on what I have seen, um, it is mainly political leaders who are abusing and misusing intelligence for political gain. Um, I could only really find one case uh, that you might suggest is an intelligence agency is trying to undermine a policy of the government. And that was when Gough Whitlam first came to power in 1972. And uh, he refused to have some of his personal staff vetted by ASIO. Now, ASIO at the time were very unhappy with this. And so was the United States too. And, and you know, all sorts of threats were leveled um, against Gough Whitlam that he had to have his staff vetted or they would cut off the flow of intelligence between the US and Australia. And that if he didn't have his staff vetted, his um, government wouldn't be kept in the loop on intelligence material coming from the Five Eyes, et cetera. And that. Explain the Five Eyes, please. Uh, the Five Eyes is the, uh, the, the intelligence uh, ally, um, alliance between the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and New Zealand and Australia. And it's basically um, a global ex-Commonwealth sort of web of intelligence sharing. So we share all of those intelligence um, findings between those countries. Okay. Now, of course, Whitlam, um, he didn't want his staff subject to vetting at the time. He thought he could trust his own staff. And um, there were threats leveled and coming from the newspaper. What we see actually, or what I found is that um, there was a lot of these threats emanating through the media. Um, and, and this is a really interesting part that I continued in, I think it was chapter six of my book, how the Australian intelligence community had, um, had used the media uh, on several occasions to sort of propagate their own viewpoints. Uh, do you see any parallels between um, the use of intelligence uh, then and um, the uh, well, it's the, the the large claims that are made about uh, Huawei now. Mm. Uh, you know, we see claim. Well, we, uh, Huawei's already been banned from contributing to the five uh, G uh, yeah. network in Australia. Uh, do you see any are there any parallels we can or lessons we can learn from your research to the contemporary period? Look, um, I think it's really early days in this, um, and of course, we're not privy to the information. Uh, that the intelligence services are actually getting at the moment. Uh, one of the, the beautiful things about writing about historical matters on intelligence is that we can get a more um, complete picture of what's going on. Uh, it might be, you know, 30 years from now before we can actually get a really good complete picture. Um, but I, I think one of the themes that does crop up is this Cold War mentality of sort of, you know, anti-communism, um, you know, and, and this sort of threat of Asia descending from the north um, into Australia. Uh, but yet, look, at the moment, I, I would reserve my sort of opinions on the matters of what is happening um, between Australia and China at this moment until I could actually uh, get hold of more definite um, evidence. Um, are there any consequences of politicization? What happens afterwards? Is there something that, uh, that uh, you know, is there a post hoc um, yeah, understanding of, of um, politicization. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, 
I, I keep referring back to the motivation for my um, my work in this field, which is Iraq. Um, what we really see is the disintegration of trust between um, the public and its intelligence services, but we also see a um, disruption be of trust between the intelligence services and government. Um, these fractures in that relationship can take a long time to repair. Um, we know that the intelligence community and policymakers need to have a very good um, convivial relationship. Instances of politicization really um, disrupt that relationship. Um, but we also know that um, instances of politicization can have damning effects on the morale of staff of intelligence agencies as well. And there are several cases where after cases of politicization, intelligence staff have really suffered um, from the abuse of their sort of work, uh, especially in cases when intelligence agencies are scapegoated uh, for bad policy outcomes, which I think really tended to happen in the Iraq case. Right. Um, have there been attempts by uh, parliament or by the government mm. uh, to rectify um, the problem for intelligence politicization, or does it suit them to uh, to be able to, you know, have their finger on the on mm. the on the uh, on on the scale, tilting it yeah. from time to time? Yeah. Look, um, when you look back at the history of these things, there's been there there have been a lot of attempts at reform, and uh, one of the one of the points I make in the book is that these attempt, these attempts at reform almost uh, form a sine wave pattern. You know, we see instances of politicization. Could you explain the sine wave, please, for those of us who didn't do oh, physics? So, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, sine wave is just sort of, you know, up and down sort of patterns like okay. that. So we see instances of politicization and then we see instances of trying to reform the situation. I mean, uh, this goes back almost to you know um, the Second World War um, at the time we saw um, inquiries by Alexander Duncan and John Moorhood um, trying to relieve some of the problems that were occurring uh, between military intelligence and the domestic intelligence um, communities uh, and you know the these inquiries were circumscribed and didn't really um, provide adequate um, solutions to the problems. We know that there were also committees like the Airy Committee, which tried to address similar problems. And then moving forward, we know the notorious cases of um, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. No, no, what about that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, we can talk about that. Look, you know, again, after the fact of Iraq, questions uh, emanated and, and a number of them came from intelligence staff themselves. Um, there was a lot of disquiet then. Um, people were not happy about the way intelligence had been used to try and, well, almost used to sort of justify um, the decision to invade Iraq. And if you look at uh, a lot of the uh, parliamentary debates at the time, you can see political leaders saying, to paraphrase, uh, they're basically saying that this is you know intelligence is telling us that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. This is a decision based on intelligence. So you know there's a real there's a bit of sort of scapegoating there. It's not a political decision to invade Iraq. It becomes an intelligence decision. Intelligence is the telling us that these things are happen happening, and we must invade Iraq to disarm Saddam Hussein of his weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and we know that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security investigated um, the intelligence on that issue. Now, they looked at, uh, look, I have a, a few problems with that inquiry in specifically in terms of politicization. It was so narrowly defined. Now, one of the things I found when I started looking at this issue is that politicization is often defined as the fault of intelligence analysts. It's seen as, you know, intelligence analysts are adding their own bias. They're trying to, you know, gain favor with political leaders. They're trying to gain favor with their superiors. That it generally emanates from the analyst's position. 
And this very much is reflected in the, the Parliamentary Joint Committee's review. And they only looked at intelligence emanating from the intelligence community. No consideration, consideration at all was given to how intelligence was actually used. We also see in a subsequent review conducted by Philip Flood, the same sorts of things. Um, I should add, Philip Flood did give the issue of politicization a bit more sort of, um, a bit more meat on the bone, shall we say. But still, it was always about how intelligence agencies or intelligence analysts might have um, uh, corrupted the product that they produce. No consideration was really given to how it was used in the political or public arena. And one of my major findings and one of my major concerns is the lack of accountability by political leaders about how they actually used intelligence and how they politicize it themselves. Um, you know, if we, we are in the middle, we, we are not in the middle, we, we are in um, the longest military deployment mm. that Australia has faced with the Afghanistan uh, deployment since 2001 yeah. and you know there are still troops there and yes there has been a withdrawal but then people went back in and we're back in the Middle East yeah. um, and there are now without wanting to prejudice any uh, legal matters we, we you know there, there is there are stories in the press yeah um, about uh, allegations of war crimes yeah and we have the case of a gentleman by the name of David McBride uh, who is, uh, well, he's facing up to life in prison mm. uh, for disclosing uh, yeah. um, information, which he had previously tried to disclose inside the system. Yeah. To yeah. no avail. Uh, could you say a little bit about that without, uh, you, sure? you know, I mean, you, you don't have any inside information, presumably, neither no. do I. So no. we can't actually prejudice any trials. But what would you like to, what's your, well, what's your view of that? I think, you know, I, I, you kind of hit the nail on the head there, Clint. I think it's very much um, along the lines of um, whistleblowing. There are very few protections um, or avenues for people to blow the whistle on these sorts of things. Um, you know, Australia has notoriously bad um, whistleblower protections uh, and people involved in the military and especially the intelligence community have even less avenues of protection when it comes to whistleblowing. It's hard at this point, again, to know, you know, the allegations, we have allegations coming from the media. I, I, I don't doubt the sincerity of what the media is reporting on this issue. Um, but again, without, you know, full disclosure of the facts, it's really hard to say what's happening here. It could be that, um, you know, there are attempts here to discredit the Australian military. That's a possibility. I'm not saying it's true, but it's a possibility. But I think, you know, Overall, what we do need to see is um, more protections for people in the military and people in the intelligence community to be able to come out and have their say on things that they see uh, being corrupted and going wrong in these, um, these ways. This is the thing that uh, David McBride, I think he's a major, uh, I'm not sure what his rank is now, mm. um, has actually been trying, had actually tried to do. Right. And uh, having, from, from what we understand, uh, re received very little traction or reaction, uh, yeah. uh, then, you know, went to uh, the press mm. and he's now facing trial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, but there is the Public uh, Inf Information Disclosure Act, you know, the PID, I think sure. it's called. Yeah. Uh, what's the problem with that? Well, you know, in terms of uh, intelligence personnel, people involved with intelligence, um, uh, you know, there are certain areas where that doesn't apply. Um, we right. know so that there's a carve out for the whole intelligence community. Yeah? yeah, none of that applies to the intelligence community at all. So the Public Industry Disclosure Act doesn't apply. And, um, you know, uh, we, we've seen with instances of, uh, you know, Witness K and Bernard Caleri trying to bring uh, matters to court there. The government can basically sort of, um, they can cover up or I, I don't think cover up's the right word. They can they can throw a blanket over whatever they would like not to be made public. Mm. Um, and these court cases and things like that, they're not open to public access. So, you know what though, one thing about this is that if uh, the disclosures are about our operations, mm. that's no longer intelligence. 
that's just operational information. It might be secret, mm. but it's not knowledge of the enemy. And so it's not intelligence. The, the intelligence community is carved out. Yeah. Uh, but simply disclosing information about your own side is not intelligence. Intelligence is evaluated information about the sure. target. Not about what your own side is doing. That, that may well be protected by secrecy laws, sure. but I don't believe that's actually part of the, the intelligence carve out at all. No, look, I, I agree with you, Clinton. And I, I, and I think that, you know, it, it's this blanket that they can throw over it. And because it falls under operations, you know, always it is the operational parts of intelligence that can never be disclosed. And I can understand that to a point. I, I really can. Operational matters of intelligence can't be sort of made public. It's one of the big caveats that all intelligence agencies will, um, you know, put out what, you know, we can never reveal operational matters. So once you sort of label something as an operational matter, we are allowed to sort of then cover it with that blanket of secrecy. Mm -hmm. Is, is there any way out of this? I mean, to me, it just seems like the test is whether there's harm that's done to the interest, not Absolutely. simply whether, not whether uh, something's disclosed or not. I, look, it, this, is, this is a huge question. Is there a way out of this? I, I you know, look, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a huge question. I don't know. Um, some people have called for things like, um, you know, standing royal commissions on intelligence and security. Um, you know, there are possibly other ways of dealing with this, you know, bringing in all parties uh, uh, to sit on matters of intelligence and security. Uh, we know that the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security um, is a very small department. Um, and it, you know, maybe it does its best to deal with some of the matters that are presented to it. But I don't think it's enough. I, I think a lot more needs to be done. And from my perspective, I think um, we really need to see multi-party oversight of intelligence and a mechanism for people involved in military intelligence and national security intelligence to be able to come out and say, look, this is what we've seen. This is what's happened and we think it's wrong. And they need to be able to do that without fear of losing their position, without fear of being discredited um, and without fear of being slandered in the media or by political leaders and, uh, themselves. But of course, then once you start looking at these issues, it, it just opens up another, a, a whole other dimension. And we know that, um, you know, uh, Justice uh, Flood looked at, he conducted Philip one of Flood, the, Justice Hope, you mean? Oh, sorry, sorry, Justice Hope. Thank you. Yep. He, he looked at um, probably the biggest swathe of Australian intelligence history um, that's ever been conducted. And he made some recommendations that really did help on these things, but he didn't really make a lot of recommendations in terms of whistleblowing, in terms of protecting staff that saw misdeeds occurring. So this is something that I think, um, you know, the Australian Parliament really needs to deal with at the moment. Uh, do you want to open up for any questions that might come in? I, mean, yeah. I do want to ask you questions about writing your book, uh, sure. the barriers to writing archival access, but I don't want to monopolize <laughs> uh, the thing with my questions. Oh, no, I appreciate um, your questions, um, Clinton. Thank you. But yeah, sure. If, um, if there are people that have questions, why don't we open it up? Yep. Okay, so I already have a question lined up from someone that um, asked not to be named. They've said, what do you see the future being in regards to intelligence, targeting slash discrediting of the public that have strong mistrust in the government, activists and generally concerned citizens? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, I think the future lies in data analysis. Um, that's where it's going to happen. I think really what we're seeing is a shift from the traditional practices of, you know, um, looking for spies and that sort of thing on the ground to using data. I think the same thing will happen, but the process will slightly change. Instead of, um, we're going to be looking at people's data that they use online, you know, all of that digital area, and that then will form the basis of being able to discredit activists, to discredit people who are involved in uh, things that the government doesn't like to see happen. So really, I think there'll be a shift from those traditional avenues of, um, you know, uh, hunting spies in, in, in human it, to use the um, parlance of uh, 
the type of um, intelligence work to sort of seek uh, signals and information gathering, largely coming from um, data mining. Uh, do you have any just to uh, just to follow up on that? Do you have any views on the fact that the uh, the Christchurch uh, terrorist uh, was uh, simply seemed to pass uh, below the radar of our intelligence agencies? Mm. There just wasn't much focus on that. Uh, wh what's the reason? Wh what do you think is the reason for that? I, I think you know probably there are a couple of things going here on here, um, and and one of them is that the intelligence services at the moment are bombarded with massive amounts of data. Um, all of the agencies are looking at so much data that it, it's not unreasonable uh, for things to pass under their radar, and uh, people like the Christchurch. Um, killer, his name escapes me, um, didn't have huge online presences um, and they, they weren't sort of out in the community in terms of activism and things like that. And it's not surprising at all that they, they fall under the radar because, um, I, you know, maybe that, that, that was part of his plan is to not be picked up. But yeah, look, these things happen. Um, you know, there is a lot of people think intelligence agencies are omnipotent, that they're, you know, able to look over your shoulder from um, a satellite, you know, in space and, you know, read what's going on in your phone. Um, and the other perspective is that they're either, they're either omnipotent or they're incompetent. So that they, um, you know, they can't do anything right. They can't get anything right. Um, so. I think wouldn't that just be a matter. wouldn't that just be a priority thing though? I mean, if you if you if you disc, if you say that the the, the the principal targets and priorities for the government are going to be um, extremist terrorists, mm. right? uh, then they'll focus on that. But if the government has not laid it out as as a priority, then mm. they will not be focusing on um, extreme terror, um, say from um, you know, the fascist side or eco fascists. Well, um, so it's not really a failure so much as as an intelligence failure as an intelligence policy problem. Oh, most definitely. I think uh, the priorities that uh, agencies are given to look at is a bit of an issue, but this is a long-standing issue. I mean, they've always been directed to look at the left. Um, this is this is not my opinion. This is fact. It's there in the evidence. Um, very, very little of what the security services look at in terms of the right of politics it actually exists. Um, Gough Whitlam made a huge point of this when he... Um, when he came into government and disclosed a lot of what um, ASIO had been researching. So maybe they are still continuing in this ideological mindset. I don't know, this is uh, just, I'm just hypothesizing here. Maybe there is still a, a continued mindset of looking at certain categories of terrorism. And uh, if you don't fit within that category, you tend to slip under the radar. Look, never mind Whitlam, 45 years ago, I'm just talking mm. like two years ago, you had the uh, Secretary of the Home Affairs Department, Mike mm. Mitsulo, um, you know, laying out seven gathering storms <laughs> and major threats and uh, extreme terror from the right was just not one of them. And well, uh, he yeah. promised after that in Parliament that uh, there was going to be sustained pressure. Yeah. Uh, you know, two years later or a year later, nobody knows what's, what, what they've done. Well, look, if history's any guide, that is not going to change. And look, it's not, I don't think it's, I, look, I, I think you're right. It is a policy problem. I don't think it's particularly because any of the intelligence services have a predilection to wanting to investigate the left of politics and, you know, let the right go through. It's possibly because the, uh, the political establishment has that predilection and not the intelligence services. I mean, we have to remember they're the ones that give the intelligence services their sort of directions mm -hmm. and uh, ask them to sort of look at these issues. Okay, so, so, so right now we've got, um, uh, we've got like a pressing issue, yeah, with mm -hmm. uh, um, what's believed to be um, China... Uh, requesting interviews with uh, journalists posted mm -hmm. to Beijing. But yeah. it turns out that in fact, ASIO had uh, uh, rated oh, uh, the Chinese journalists who they believe to be intelligence collectors yeah. even before that had happened. Yeah. Uh, and, and the raids on a, uh, on a member of the legislative council in New South Wales, a gentleman called Shauket Musulman. I'd never heard of him until uh, the raids. I don't know how influential he, was actually, he actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, but, yeah. but this is the, the, the new the new uh, heat of mm. intelligence is focusing quite 
heavily on the relationship with China. Yes, well, you see of it, course. I mean, you know, it, it's just an extension of the Cold War, really, isn't it? Um, you know, the left and communism is the enemy. I, I, I would wonder how much of uh, an issue this would be if we had a different government at the moment. I, I really do. I, I'm not sure where this is coming from, but uh, I think it's coming from um, the uh, political party in power at the moment, who always needs to, as they have done in the past, have a boogeyman. There has to be a boogeyman. Uh, I like your touching faith in the Labour opposition. We'll see. <laughs> we'll uh, see. There, there are certain <laughs> questions uh, for Ma from Maddie uh, via some of Sure. Else. Yes. Go ahead. So next up, we have Mark, who wanted to ask a question. Sure. You with us, Mark? Mark is muted. Hey, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm yeah, on a bus. I'm on a bus. I apologise, but uh, <laughs> I had to ask the question. Isn't this ultimately a political challenge, though? If we, if if we are not to sort of talk about this for an eternity, isn't it an a legislative approach uh, required where someone of talent writes appropriate whistleblowing legislation uh, in, in terms that can actually succeed in a court? And we know from the, the current PID uh, legislation that it can't succeed in the court or it's very difficult to succeed in the court. Can't someone write that legislation? Don't leave it to a government or to an opposition to do so and then agitate across the political spectrum for people to embrace it. Ah, yeah, thanks for your question, Mark. Um, look, yeah, there needs to be a political, uh, there needs to be a political want as well as a judicial want. You know, there needs, it, it, it takes people to really want to be able to do this. Um, and, and I think my response is that uh, uh, there aren't a lot of people in politics in the Senate who, who want this to happen. Look at Julian Assange at the moment. I mean, why isn't the Australian government trying to do something for him? There's no want to do it there. The alliance is what matters. Uh, and anyone who sort of blows a whistle, it's just fodder, you know. They're people that fall by the wayside. It doesn't matter because the alliance is what matters. Um, so in terms of legislation, look, it would have to pass, you know, both houses of parliament, the, the, the parliament and the Senate. And I just don't think, I, firstly, I don't think there's a want for it to pass. And I don't think there's a deep insightful knowledge of what is actually happening here on the part of senators and parliamentarians to understand it at the level that is needed to write really good legislation on this matter. Clinton, did the, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to ask if the government uh, were uh, instructing the agencies to uh, take a closer look at, say, environmental uh, mm. activists or protesters opposed to, say, coal or you know, not, you know, fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, and is, is focusing on them as opposed to, say, other threats. Uh, how would we even know that that's going on? Well, this is why it's so important to have an, an unencumbered media, a media that is able to report on issues and not be censored by the government. Um, and at the moment, I don't think that is entirely the case. Um, the media plays a huge role in bringing these matters to uh, the public's attention. Um, and unless the media do it, I don't, I don't really see, I mean, who else is there available to actually bring these matters to the public attention? Well, well, the media can't do it if they are barred from doing so by secrecy legislation. Exactly. And, and you know, that's, um, that, that's not coincidental, I don't think. It's all about, you know, maintaining a status quo. We don't want these agitators in the media. I mean, a lot of the media are seen as left wing. They're seen as a lot of, you know, anti-government. <laughs> well... No, no, seriously, that, uh, because if you look at it, if you look at yeah. the uh, uh, at uh, the nine organisation, um, mm. which uh, has a political figure from the right on the on the board, mm. uh, Mr. Costello, uh, and they they control the Age, City Morning Herald, the Fin Review, mm. um, and so on. And then you've got the the News Corporation thing. I can't 
I don't know where this idea that the, the media is seen as left wing comes from. Well, maybe left wing is a different, maybe that's not the appropriate way of saying it. Uh, what I know from looking at evidence is that many of these organizations have been in the pockets of the government for decades, for decades, and the information gets fed to them. Um, so maybe what we're actually seeing is just in the media, a reflection of the government's agenda. But I do think it's incredibly important to have an independent media to be able to report on these things because there aren't a lot of avenues um, otherwise for people to sort of, you know, get, get the traction that's needed on these um, topics. Yeah, you got some more questions coming in. Sure. So I have a comment from Cam, who's unable to speak at the moment. Yep. Because it has been suggested recently that last time far-right extremists were mentioned by ASIO publicly was in 1991 by Evan Smith. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, look, um, I'm, not, I'm not up on that case myself. Um, what I do know is that um, when, in the 1970s, after we had a 23 year period of Liberal Party uh, rule, Gough Whitlam came into office and he was shown um, all of this information that the, some of the security services were working with the media and what he saw is that 98% of it was involved with agitating against the left. I suspect that, you know, this is possibly still continuing. Um, the right just doesn't seem to get traction. Um, well, you know, it, it's actually the far right. It, it's not necessarily conservative points of view, but it's actually those, you know, far right agitators that don't seem to get a lot of uh, traction in the press. Look, I mean, I could speculate on why that might be the case. The government doesn't want it put out there. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it, it, it has been a historical um, case that the right does escape much of this, um, this discussion. I have another question from Katie, who says, who directs the agency's agendas, government or intelligence hierarchy? Well, this is a great question, Katie, and um, thank you. Um, of course, um, inspect, uh, the director generals of the agencies have the ability to uh, set their own operational uh, goals, but um, most requirements will be set from the government. So uh, governments do set what the agencies overall will look at because the purpose of intelligence is to help inform government policy. But this is the problem that I, um, I, I want to point out. Often it's, you know, in the past at least, it's been about advocating for certain perspectives and not so much this sort of at arm's length, shall we say, type of, um, you know, giving them the facts and let uh, the government sort of work out a position on that. I'll just add uh, yeah. something here to Katie. It's the National Security Committee of Cabinet. Um, so not the entire cabinet, just the people involved in national security, the attorney general, the foreign minister, the defense minister, the minister for justice, uh, the prime minister and the treasurer. And uh, they, they are the national security committee of cabinet. There is underneath them, the secretary's committee on national security scons, and they then go ahead and implement it. But there is a symbiotic process in which uh, the intelligence agencies inform uh, the policymakers as to the kinds of threats that they found. And then the policymakers then even look at that and, and they decide, okay, well, this is what we need you to target. And then the agencies go and target. So that there is political control of the agencies. The problem is there's no legislative involvement. Uh, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security cannot examine the operations, uh, any operation past, present or proposed uh, conducted by an intelligence agencies, nor can they examine the ministerial guidelines, the ministerial instructions uh, relating to the targeting um, of Australians. Um, and so given that the legislative branch is totally locked out and you've got the, the judicial branch of government, the, the courts are also locked out. So all you've got is very tight control by the executive branch. Um, and so there's really no meaningful oversight. 
can just yeah. add that. No, great, excellent point, Clinton. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I probably just add that the um, National Security Committee of Cabinet is also only made up of um, the governing party of the day. There's no um, uh, opposition members or members of any other parties involved. So I think we have time for one last question from somebody else who has asked, what in your experience is the reason why so-called Australia's security and protection law is so notoriously bad? Mm. Well, that that's a huge question again. Um, it, it has to do, I think, mainly with uh, the policy aspect. And again, you know, and I think Clinton has made this point. Um, if you make good policy, you don't need to extend um, legislation uh, and, you know, give intelligence agencies extended powers and extended reach to uh, make up for those uh, bad policy decisions. So really, that's what it comes, but comes down to, in my opinion. You need very good policy to start with. And without that, the rest sort of crumbles away. Um, Clinton, did you have anything to yeah, add? I just, well, well, I wanted to just follow up on that by asking you a question. Mm -hmm. uh, given the, uh, the very uh, great prominence that foreign interference and foreign influence now has in the public sphere, yeah. how do we know that um, th uh, the talk of, uh, of uh, foreign agents, agents of foreign influence, uh, is legitimate and not being politicized? <laughs> how, how do we tell that? Uh, we don't. We, there's no way of knowing. I mean, of course... Um, like any good scholarship, we need to look at the evidence. Um, and unless we're given access to that evidence, we don't really have any concrete way of knowing. I suppose the other way to think about it is, is when we see these things appearing in the media and that, uh, we need to ask ourselves who is benef benefiting here. Who's going to benefit from what information is pre presented? So you think that the, the, the agencies might be giving certain journalists the drop? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I mean, if history is any guide, yes. I don't expect those sort of things have changed much. I'm, I, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that I have access to any evidence to say otherwise, but um, what I can say is in the past, this has been the situation. It's unlikely that it's changed. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I actually think there's one more time for a comment. Stuart. Okay. From Rob Cool. Isn't it a special kind of irony that whistleblowers are a virtual source of information, yet they lack protection? Mm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Just ask Bernard Calario, David McBride. <laughs> uh, I, I have a, I have a, a or, in, or, you know, um, uh, there's a certain trial going on in the United Kingdom with Mr. Assange. Mm. Uh, could you speak briefly about uh, archival access? The National Archives of Australia is the repository mm. of, uh, of the nation's you know, memory. Um, you obviously use a lot of these archival resources in your book. Talk about yeah. that, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I'd also just like to say, yes, look, I agree cl with Clinton what he just said about uh, whistleblowers uh, and, you know, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, great examples of what happens uh, when you try to release data and information about what's really going on. Um, on Clinton's question about archival access, yeah, look, I, I suppose this really kind of ties into this, this kind of question of whistleblowing as well, um, and access to data. Um, look, the Australian archives were very helpful uh, in terms of uh, getting access to material. Um, there are obviously a lot of frustrations that go along with that. Um, a lot of material is still uh, classified. Um, I'll give you one example. I had uh, trouble getting access to um, material that uh, that was generated in 1901. Uh, for some reason, the archives had uh, trouble releasing that information to me, although it was over a hundred and something years old. Um, but there were many cases that I would have written about in the book had I been able to get access to archival material. Um, what you also find, ironically, is that the Americans are a lot better with this. They are declassifying uh, their intelligence material at a rate that far exceeds what the Australians are doing. Um, the British kind of a bit sort of similar to Australia, but I would say they're a bit better than what we do. 
Um, but this is always a problem for any researcher trying to investigate a state and what goes on behind closed doors. Um, those things that are not presented in the media, those things that are not presented in parliament, but you know, the discussions between the directors of intelligence services and their ministers, um, those, that sort of material is, even though there is a requirement to release it after 30 years, often keeps on getting um, reclassified or withheld pending, pending agency advice. So there are huge problems with that. And, you know, you, you kind of have to sort of piece together what you can get access to. Um, of course, there are, there are problems with that. But um, yeah, I, I would have loved um, to investigate several other cases that I, I know of that are worth investigating that I wasn't able to get the, um, the full uh, amount of information to, to make cases out of them. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, did you have any last comments before we close up? Um, well, I'd just like to thank everyone who joined us here tonight um, for the discussion. Uh, it was great to hear your questions. Um, I'd also like to thank the uh, NIBS for hosting the event. Thanks, Maddie, for being a gracious host. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Fernandez for being such a great um, it's the Monash University Publishing. They're the ones that publish. Oh, the don't forget. Yeah, no, <laughs> Monash University Publishing, who have been um, an enormous and great support throughout the whole process of publishing the book. I, um, you know, I couldn't have done it without their help. All of the people involved over there at Monash have been so great, so helpful, um, generous, and um, really forthcoming with all of their advice. So thank you so much. Uh, can I just add just a 30 seconds, Matty, or less? Uh, look, I think it's a very important book that you wrote simply because we don't have enough studies of Australia. People mm -hmm. can tell you all about Comey and Muller and all these other guys. Yeah. What about our own country? So you've made a real contribution to that. And uh, I, I congratulate you on your book. Uh, thank, thank you, Clinton. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Justin. And if anyone is interested in grabbing his book, you can get it from Nibs. I've sent the link in the chat or you can just go nibs.org.au. We are so happy to have the book and thank you so much to both Justin and Clinton for joining us tonight. And Sam, I can see you on, <laughs> online. Thank you Hi, Sam. Sam from <laughs> Monash University Publishing for bringing us, all of us together tonight. So thank you. We wouldn't have been able to come together if it wasn't for you. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you to Monash. You. Uh, it's important that you guys are publishing books on Australia's history and Absolutely. politics. Uh, we, we need more of our own history and, and stories being told. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree totally with Clinton. Um, yes, people write more about Australian history is not a dying topic. It is actually very alive and uh, something that is richly fulfilling. And um, I implore anyone to keep exploring those issues that we've been talking about tonight. All right. Thank you.